Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our chess webinar on oral therapies for COVID-19. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Alice Gallo. I'm a staff intensivist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And I would like to welcome all of our panelists. So Catherine, welcome. Would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Uh, Catherine Bergeron, a commander in the United States Navy. I am stationed at Naval Medical Center San Diego, where I am an infectious disease physician, uh, program director for the ID Fellowship, um, and chair of um, some of our research efforts. Thank you so much for joining us today. Prashant? Hi, uh, I'm Prashant Malhotra. I'm an associate professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at uh, the Ronald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Northwell Hofstra, which is in Long Island in New York. And I am primarily a clinician who sees a lot of patients and also dabbles in a little bit of clinical research. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Stephen? Uh, thank you, Alice. Yeah, Steve Gordon, uh, Chairman of the Department of Infectious Disease at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. It's a pleasure to be here. And Catherine, thank you for your service. My pleasure. Thank you all so much for being here. And I want to remind our audience, if you have questions, please put them either on the chat box or in the Q&A, and we're gonna be answering them live. And we're gonna start with Catherine going over some of the basic concepts on the antivirals that we have currently available. And then we're gonna go straight to Q&A. And Catherine, you tell me when you want your next slide, okay? Okay, sounds good, thank you. So I figured I'd just give everybody a little bit of background because I know people are coming in from different uh, practice uh, settings and these medications are brand new. So I figured we'd just have a quick overview. Um, the views expressed are those of us presenting, not necessarily our employers. So um, just to recap, there's antibodies and antivirals. We're talking about antivirals. Go ahead, next slide. Um, and specifically, we're gonna focus on the oral antivirals, which at this point are Paxlovid and Molnupiravir. Next slide. So Paxlovid, it is a ritonavir-boosted protease inhibitor. Um, from all of those of you who remember HIV, uh, we do still have protease inhibitors floating around. Um, and it comes in the standard formulation um, of 300 milligrams plus 100 milligrams of ritonavir. The 300 milligrams is conveniently in two separate pills. And so for renal dose adjustment, um, you are able to give one of the, um, of the uh, normal, uh, sorry, no normal trivir and one of their ritonavir uh, for people who have a GFR uh, that is uh, 30 to 60. Uh, if they're above 60, they get the two plus one. Um, the big catch with Paxlovid is you have to watch for drug interactions. CDC has published a list that is not all inclusive. So what I recommend to people at this point is to run the Lexicomp interaction checker with ritonavir. So Paxlovid, uh, last I checked, was not uploaded into the system, but you can use ritonavir and that will work all right. Um, steroids are very problematic, especially fluticasone, and lots of people are on fluticasone, especially in the outpatient setting, which is how these medications are currently authorized under the EUA. Um, unfortunately, they're not authorized for inpatients at this time. Uh, so really do scrub the med list uh, before you issue these medications. If they're on steroids for another reason, it's probably all right to continue it if they're on, you know, prednisone for um, COPD or brachiectasis or something of that nature. Um, but definitely if they're on um, fluticasone, you would wanna stop that uh, and not overlap with the Paxlovid. It's only five days of medication, so it's probably not the end of the world. You're probably not gonna see Cushing's um, with prednisone or buclomethasone or even Dex. Um, aside from fluticasone, the, the steroids are category C, fluticasone category X. Um, it's nice if you can tell if they're HIV negative, but honestly, five days is probably not going to induce resistance um, for protease inhibitors if you don't have the status of HIV or if they're not undetectable. Um, so you're probably all right. And then you can use Paxlovid in children ages 12 and up, as long as they're over 40 kilos. The original data from Paxlovid um, showed 89% efficacy if taken within three days of onset. Uh, of symptoms and 88% if taken within uh, five days of symptoms. And that's from the EPIC high risk trial. Um, so the current EUA is authorized for um, use within five days of onset. I know that's tricky um, with regard to testing and turnaround and how all that follows up. And we'll talk a little bit about that as a group. Feel free to pose your questions in terms of how everyone is um, implementing at their sites. 
Um, for the regular risk population, it, it is showing a 70% risk reduction. Now, caveat is that all of this is pre-Omicron data. It's all based on Delta. Um, we are uh, thinking that it is going to work fairly well. The um, advisor has said that it works okay. It is a protease inhibitor, so it is independent of the spike protein, but I haven't seen actual numbers on efficacy uh, for reduction of severe outcomes in COVID. Next slide. So our next oral option is molnupiravir. Uh, it's a Merck product, 800 milligrams, uh, twice a day for five days. It must be given again within the first five days of symptoms uh, with a confirmed diagnosis according to the EUA. Um, this is only approved for adults and GFR greater than 30. Uh, it had a 50% efficacy for earlier variants, but with Omicron, they are thinking that it's about 30% efficacy. It's the same mechanism of action as remdesivir, so it's an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase inhibitor. Um, and unlike remdesivir, where we have uh, lots of data in pregnancy, including back to the Ebola outbreak in 2014 in West Africa, um, molnupiravir carries a contraindication for pregnancy at this time. Um, in addition, in children, there's some concern for inhibition of uh, bone and tendon growth, so adults only who are non-pregnant. All right, and um, uh, just one more slide. Um, so. And we'll talk about as a group, please feel free to ask your questions. How do you prioritize who gets what? Uh, preliminarily, NIH has laid out a prioritization. So Paxlovid being first choice, and then Sotrovimab, which is um, monoclonal antibody infusion active against Omicron. Third choice is remdesivir, outpatient IV protocol as per the New England Journal. And then molnupiravir is listed as the fourth choice. So um, that's all I have for today. Just wanted to give a bit of background and then um, uh, turn it back over to Alice to for uh, opening to question. So we're going to start with the first question from that was sent previously by the audience. Um, wh what are the perfect patients, or tell me like some patients that you would use this this um, antivirus for? Like, give me a case scenario and which one you pick. Stephen, how about you start? Yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, with the nice introduction, I think that's going to be to be determined. I, I do want to highlight that this data was, as was mentioned, pre-Omicron, but also in a population that was what I call spike naive. So these were not patients who were vaccinated um, and not patients who had prior COVID. And fast forward now into February almost of 2022, that is different. It's estimated, as we all know, that 50% of Americans are going to be infected if they haven't been with Omicron. And that's at least 70% of American adults have had at least one vaccine. So it's a different population uh, than was studied. And I think that also has to be taken into account in terms of what the cost benefit ratio is here. Remember the initial trials were also done to prevent severe disease. And if you look at those, it's not, I'm looking at Alice, it's not, wasn't your transplant population or things of this nature. It was people like me, a little bit chubby, uh, and, and people like me, maybe a little bit over 60. So um, I think all that has to be taken into account. But I think the other thing for me is my focus now is preventing severe disease. So I'd be looking at patients who could benefit that have risk factors for severe disease um, and infected whether or not they're, they're spike exposed or not, we, we can talk about, um, but that would be for me, I'm really only interested in testing to treat now in to prevent the disease. And that, as we'll talk about further, is create some challenges because you need the test to get the treatment. Um, and the only thing I would say is encourage your patients to go on, uh, what was that, uh, covidtest.government so that they at least have in their home access for rapid testing because a rapid testing is kosher to show your primary care, your televisit to get any of those therapies that Catherine said. Um, so I, I'll, let, I'll pass the baton here. So what I would like to second over there is as Dr. Gordon and Steve just said, basically these trials were all done in unvaccinated patients. And if you looked at whether they had had prior infections, I mean, they were excluded if they were actively infected. But if you look at, for example, uh, I mean, both the move out, which was the Merck Molnupiravir trial, as well as the EPIC uh, a trial, which was for the Paxlovid, about 47% patients in that trial had antibodies. So, you know, as he said, that these were spike naive patients mostly that were picked. There is an uh, arm of the EPIC-SR trial, which is the 
Paxlovid trial, which is happening in standard risk patients. So these are patients who are not high risk, which is looking at people who are previously vaccinated. And that may give us some insight into whether, you know, people who are sp not spike naive will have some benefit. That being said, to answer your question, Alice, I think the people who would benefit the most at this point would be the people who would have high risk factors for progression to severe disease. And who are those patients? I mean, there are well-defined criteria by the CDC as to who constitutes high risk. Age is one of the important factors, comorbidities like obese people, diabetic people, renal uh, you know, disease people, cancer people, people who are immunosuppressed. And to that, I would add people who are unvaccinated are probably the people that I would choose. But again, remember, these are effective only early in the disease. So as uh, Steve pointed out, that you have to basically also, um, you know, combine this with early diagnosis and early testing, and that is where the rapid testing may come in. We are prioritizing at our facility according to the NIH tiers, um, and right now, due to short supply, we're prioritizing tier one, which is immunocompromised. Um, with as supply relaxes or as demand relaxes, opening up to the other tiers. And and immunocompromised. Um, are usually vaccinated. Oh, let me rephrase. Immunocompromised are right now mostly vaccinated, right? So you're still using, you're extrapolating the data from like spike naive and using in the immunocompromised who are vaccinated. We are with the uh, presumption that they may not generate their own antibodies. And so they're similarly equivalent to spike naive. No, but that's fascinating. Thank you for teaching me. I love this. And uh, I, I did. I wanted to also pose the question. Um, like everything in COVID so far, a lot of we've noticed a lot of um, inequity in distribution of tests and in, in vaccination availability. And I'm wondering what the panel thinks about how. Um, equitable the distribution of these medications is going or will be or plans for that and what can we do as clinicians at bedside to decrease any um, inequities that might present to us well we <laughs> Well, I'll take the first swing, Alice, because I think this is important. You know, one thing we've learned about COVID, as you mentioned, is the disparity of health and wellness based on zip code, right? I mean, these are what we call the social determinants of health, which have been exposed in COVID. And then speaking, because I know there's the audience is global, um, you can expand that in terms of other equity, right? I mean, the WHO is still saying no one is safe until we're all safe um, in, in how you define that now, whether natural immunity immunization, I think becomes important. And we all recognize that in healthcare. I think the, what we can do or what some of the lessons we're trying to learn is those community activators um, in terms of these areas in our cities that are least accessible to primary care or, you know, to access and trying to get the community activators in, um, in the reason, you know, to me, I'm old enough to go back to HIV. You can do HIV seroprevalence testing, which was done, but if you're not going to help the people with the test, what, what's the purpose? And that's where I think one of, one of where I'm thinking is the test to treat, right? So I'm only going to be testing you in these areas, uh, you know, to get to Prashant's point and Catherine's point, if there's a, a roadmap for treatment, if you're at risk for high risk to severe disease, if that makes sense, that's much easier said than done. Um, and looking at all the potential contraindications, drug interactions, um, and then the creatinine clearances, you know, you also need a pharmacist. <laughs> and it won't surprise me if this ends up, quite frankly, being di distributed by pharmacists with telehealth, with people showing their rapid antigen and access to the medical records. A lot of primary care people are, you know, with the BPAs that we've set up here, they're, they're intimidated because it flashes all the time. Um, and to our transplant patients, our transplant group for the solid organs is actually avoiding uh, the Plaxivid because of the, the potential interactions and report and going more toward the sotribumab, uh, obviously for treatment and the EVI shell for prophylaxis. So I don't know what we're, what's going on at Mayo or at, at, at North Shore in the military, but, but there are already um, interesting, how could I say, biases that are occurring. Over. <laughs> 
Yes, I uh, agree. And, you know, to come back to Alice's uh, point about what we can do as physicians, I think uh, we, we need to think about it in a couple of terms. First, the reason why we, why we are having to prioritize is because there is a supply constraint because these, you know, the EOAs were issued on, if I remember correctly, the 22nd and the 23rd of December of this year. So not even a month ago. And the production needs to be ramped up. And hopefully at one point of time, we'll have enough of these oral antivirals as well as the monoclonal antibody, the sotrovimab, which still has some efficacy against the Omicron. What we can do as physicians, to be honest, one, I think, and it comes back to that, encourage vaccination, because the more people that are vaccinated, the more we may not need and we may reduce the demand. And then the second thing is, which you know the authorities and the government at this point is uh, chiming in and jumping in is provide more rapid testing. Because remember, these are medications that are active only very early in the phase. So it, it, just to give you an example, at, you know, we recently had the Omicron surge or I'm saying had, and I'm very hopeful with that because New York, the numbers are starting to come down. But at one point around Christmas, if somebody was doing a PCR, it would take about three days to get the result back. And if that is the state of affairs, these drugs are, you know, it doesn't matter what the supply is, they're just not going to be available. So encouraging rapid testing, and as Steve test said, maybe combining them with televisits, having a pharmacist on hand, because these are difficult to dispense drugs because of the interactions and some of the other things that we need to uh, take care of. But I think as physicians, encouraging vaccination, encouraging rapid testing and educating the public as well that these options are available, especially for the high risk population, that may be something that we should be doing. Yeah, it's a little bit of a staffing intensive endeavor in, term, in addition to the laboratory intensive endeavor. Um, what we're hearing from a lot of the primary care is they want this to be like Tamiflu where they can just give it out to everyone. Um, and unfortunately it doesn't quite work like that. Same with the fleet, the you know, deployed forces want, they think it's gonna get people to work faster and had to explain the provisions of the EUA. So once, it, once these get approved and once supply relaxes, then we may be in a different scenario. But right now we are um, approving these under our internal antimicrobial stewardship protocols. Um, with and we're doing it on a referral basis. So for now, we're anticipating mostly subspecialists calling with referrals over the outpatient duty phone, and then we would review with them and uh, pharmacy and approve that way. Um, and but as supply relaxes, we we anticipate needing to review that. I hear I hear from all of you um, the importance of timing and. Um, Timing is something very, very hard also, very tricky to determine, right? Because again, might be that someone started with symptoms today and tomorrow they're already in my ICU, but it might be that someone started with symptoms last Friday and then they decide to get tested tomorrow because it was just like, eh, maybe a sore throat, right? So, so in your experience and in the trials, which were like the patients who responded like the best or the, the most beneficial was based on symptoms or was based on like needing to go to the hospital or if someone has hypoxemia is already too late, regardless of the timing of symptoms. Um, can, can you all talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, Alice, I'm happy to weigh in. You know, as, as was said, when we look at our COVID treatments, um, prevention up front, right? Uh, so obviously encouraging vaccine for, for those that are, are non-spike, you know, non-spike experienced, uh, recognizing natural immunity does have a protective role as well. There's, there's no question about that. Um, but then um, the problem I think now with Omicron is presentations are now muddled. Um, you know, the loss of taste and smell, which was such a, a cue last year is, is kind of, I'm not saying evaporated totally, but but gone. Some of these are posse symptomatic in part because of probable probable prior spike exposure, but the presentations now are so nonspecific. Uh, and I think that's another challenge in terms of this. You know, as Prashant has mentioned, we, we believe monoclonal antibody and antivirals in the pathogenesis of SARS-CoV-1 are most effective early. Uh, um, before the body has made antibodies or while the viral replication is still up before it goes down, which is in difference obviously to SARS-CoV-1. So, um, and that is um, again, access to testing. 
um, and access to a provider or someone who can do something with that effector arm. You know, it's interesting in stewardship, it's the same thing. We can detect organisms in blood and now we can detect resistance in the lab. But if no one is on the effector arm, the question is, why are you doing it, right? If the call goes up to the floor and, well, you know, uh, Alice is, is out, wait till, we'll wait till tomorrow. So I think it's the same principle here is that we've got to look at, at as was mentioned, how do we have frictionless, almost like an Uber, um, and making it a value proposition, not so much a cost proposition or the test proposition. The other thing that I would add to this is that all, all the antivirals we are talking about, they are primarily approved for, or not approved, but they have an emergency use authorization for outpatients. And the clock actually does not start from the time the test comes in, but from the symptom onset. So for example, for both Paxlovid and Molnupiravir, the Merck and the Pfizer drugs, it's less than five days from symptom onset. For Sotrovimab, which is the monoclonal antibody, it is less than 10 days on the EUA, even though the trial was five days. And when you look at Remdesivir in the Pine Tree trial, it was less than seven days from symptom onset. Now, which brings me to a very interesting point here, because Alice, you mentioned somebody who's entered the ICU. And which brings us to, are these even effective when a patient is so sick and there is a cytokine storm and there are lower respiratory tract signs, which basically are causing the patient to have such hypoxia that they've already ended up on a ventilator. You know, I do not think we have very good data to answer that. The molnupiravir, which is the Merck drug, there was a trial called the MOVE-IN trial in which they were actually looking at the inpatients. And that trial was halted by the Data Safety Monitoring Board because they perceived that there was a lack of efficacy. Now, if somebody was to be hospitalized with severe COVID within a few days of symptom onset, theoretically, one could say that using, it, using an antiviral may have some benefit and may have efficacy. But we know even with remdesivir, which has been studied in the inpatient side, if you look at the ACT-1 study, which was the placebo-controlled remdesivir study, most benefit was seen in patients, the inpatients there. Remember, there was a cutoff of 10 days over there from the test, but the benefit was seen in patients who were on supplemental oxygen and not actually on ventilators. And so I think when the cytokine storm has already set in and there is enough inflammation in the lung. The main pathogenesis there is immune activation and some kind of, just to put it in a very colloquial fashion, maybe a aberrant immune activation and there the immune modulators may have more efficacy as compared to the antivirals and the antivirals may be more efficacious in the outpatient setting before the, you know, we are at the stage where lung damage has already started happening. Concur with what both Dr. Gordon and Dr. Malhotra have said. Um, I've had some interesting experience with the uh, with the outpatient remdesivir infusion, and then also early remdesivir for hospitalized patients. In, for example, rheumatology patients who have a different sort of physiology associated with their presentations, and anecdotally have seen good evidence since it's been uh, fully approved and therefore no longer on the EUA with some missed cases and some early presentations where I think they were in the viral phase still, um, either immunosuppressed or uh, rheumatologically. Um, and, but that's again, infusion and not oral. So uh, unclear whether the orals would have activity in those states. Yeah, absolutely. And Prashant, just to add, I feel like by the time they come to me, it's, a, it's best supportive care from critical care. Cause I, again, so far, Honestly, again, clinical experience uh, by the time they come to the ICU and need a ventilator is best supportive care because I don't think that, I think, like you said, we lost, we lost timing for like replication, not to cause too much inflammation, but anyways. And we have a very interesting question from the audience that I would like to pose to all of you. Assuming no drug to drug interaction, how would you choose between these antivirals? And in your opinion, um, what interaction with Paxlovid, I can't say this, is acceptable? 
Oh. Catherine, how about you start this time? Okay. Um, part of it's going to determine what I have access to. So I'm going to give them what I've got. And uh, so that, that's been the deciding factor for now. And I haven't given enough of any of them to see any difference really in outcomes. Um, and sorry, what was the other question? So one was like, assuming no drug to drug interaction, how would you choose? So you said based on availability and what do you think are interactions with Paxlovid that are acceptable? So um, for things like DOAX, um, it depends on their indication. So if it is, you know, just AFib, I think you can pause their anticoagulation for, you know, the duration that they're on the Paxlovid and proceed because um, that's, that's more of a, a short-term thing rather than a long-term thing. If they're on it for, you know, critical thromb thrombosis, that's going to be more of a risk benefit decision. And I don't know that Paxlovid is going to get you where you want to be. And perhaps that would be somebody who you would want to evaluate for the outpatient run desivir. Um, and, and also just to, to add on, I think some of the messaging early in the pandemic was stay home, wait, see how you do, and then go to the ED if you're really, really sick. And I think that is going to hurt us in the context of these early medications. So, you know, to, first of all, if you were to type, say hypothetically, there is no interaction with Paxlovid. I mean, Paxlovid does have a lot of interaction and there's a lot of medication, so that scenario may not play out. But if, if that was indeed the case, I mean, th there is a couple of factors that you would want to probably take into consideration. The first thing is that with molnupiravir, which is the, you know, you would have always want to prefer the orals over the intravenous and the infusions because just because they may be difficult to arrange. But when you take the molnupiravir, there is a theoretical concern about the fact that there may be some mutagenesis because of the way that this, the mechanism of action of this drug is that it induces some errors and some mutagen, you know, there is some mutagenesis. And so there is a theoretical concern that in people of childbearing potential, there may potentially be some uh, harm that could happen. And so much so that with the molnupiravir, you're not supposed to, or theoretically, at least you're not supposed to use it in pregnant people. If you were to use, there is a lot of um, counseling as well as risk benefit consideration that you need to do with the patient and you need to uh, enroll them in a registry. At the same time, if you do think that the patient may be pregnant, you, you have to rule that out with a pregnancy test. And if the patient is not on adequate contraception, I mean, you have to assess those factors to make sure that this patient may not be pregnant. Now, also remember, based on that, with molnupiravir, it is, it is recommended that if it's given to a woman of childbearing uh, potential, four days is the time that they should be on effective contraception. And if it's given to a man who's active with somebody of childbearing potential, three months is actually the time that they should be using barrier contraception. So that's a very big time period. And that may be one thing that may be, uh, you know, making you not choose molnupiravir. The other thing that we also need to look at and you know, I say this with a grain of salt because there are no head-to-head -head comparisons or there are no clinical trials that fit Paxlovid, say, against molnupiravir or against sotrovimab or remdesivir. But when we look at the efficacy data, and that is how the CDC has given them priorities, I mean, the Paxlovid is given number one because it was like 88%. The sotrovimab was 80-something percent. The remdesivir was again in the 80s. But when you looked at the final data on molnupiravir, it actually came out to about 30% with the final data. And that is also being used in the prioritization. I take it with a pinch of salt again, because there is no head-to-head -head data with it. And the second thing also that we need to remember is that the other than molnupiravir, where the data was actually published in the New England Journal, I think last month, all the others, we have only either the data that was submitted to the FDA for the EUA, or in some cases, only the press releases. So this is not peer reviewed. And, and so you have to be very sure that, you know, what you're looking at is what the final data set is going to be. Yeah, Prashant, if I could just add on to Prashant, Catherine, I, I think, 
the other thing we have to determine is, you know, these are what we would say um, efficacy trials, not effectiveness trials, uh, you know, and it's 30 and 40 pills over five days. Um, and that's not an easy swallow. Um, and patients tend to stop taking pills if they're rendered better or, or feel that way. Um, and so I think there's a lot of caveats. There's also something to be said for some patients about it, the parenteral or even the sotrimab giving intramuscular, you know that it's a one and done, um, even though it's uh, a little bit more messy, is, especially in the high risk patients as you're talking about in avoiding the reactions, it still might be better than uh, dealing or trying to manage with nausea, vomiting or anticipated side effects. So I think we just don't have the data. As Prashant said, from the FEC data, 30% for a, for a uh, outcome would not have met criteria for vaccine efficacy. Um, that was, I, I think, another thing why uh, it's, you know, it, it's not on the top, quote unquote, clinicians list, uh, although it's something to give without the interactions. There's also the black box, I think, for men for spermatogenesis in the breastfeeding issues. Um, and so it, it's packed with a lot of potential angst, even after a patient may be done with the course. So I actually think it's too early. I mean, I, I really want to look for these EUA post-market, you know, I don't call them post-marketing, but, but really see what happens in the real world uh, in terms of, of getting a better handle uh, on that. And sometimes like the sotrivimab, I'd say an infusion or shot in the butt is, you know, maybe better in terms of realizing a one and done um, that, that you know you've done that if, if it's available. Um, and, and as was mentioned, there's shortages in some parts. And so some of this is complicated and will be complicated. That's an excellent discussion. Thank you so much. And let's pretend you're being called for an ICU consult now. And this patient is a transplant patient already received their five days of remdesivir, but still PCR positive. Would you recommend um, repeating remdesivir? And this is a question from the audience. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. So, so this question, I think, is has been well answered um, in, in terms of this. Is that you know the the assays are are very good. PCRs, as we all know, can remain positive um, even in quote unquote non immunosuppressed patients for up to ninety days, and that's why the CDC is very cautious about reinfection. Uh, you know, it's not another positive test within ninety days. Many clinicians and the ones on the board will, will go behind the scenes and ask for cycle thresholds, which are not FDA approved, but do give us, um, you know, we've all seen the 40 to 41s at the cutoffs and, and as opposed to the 15s or 20s, the ones that are hot. So, um, uh, and even, even in people know that. So what we would say is just like I support a, not a test based strategy to return to work or the workplace, these tests were not designs of test of contagiousness. Uh, nor for nor for potential uh, monitoring, like we wouldn't monitor C diff PCRs. I think we just have to be very very cautious about that. On the other hand, like all tests, we've all seen patients smells like COVID, looks like COVID, and they've got a negative nasal pharyngeal, but we're still going to potentially treat them because yes, uh, uh, you know, if you get the VAL or something, uh, they may turn out to be positive. So. So I, I think like everything else, um, you don't want to test the tail to, to wag the dog, but everyone's got pretty good experience now, I think, um, managing, treating COVID in, in, in terms of, um, uh, of, of how we approach these patients. Over. Any other yeah. comments from the panelists? Yeah, I just want to add, uh, you know, PCR being super sensitive will detect dead virus as well. So just because your PCR is positive does not mean that the patient still has an active, actively replicating virus that any of the antivirals will benefit. So, you know, we, we need to be very careful in interpreting those tests. And I would use the clinical considerations, for example, if they're on, you know, chemotherapy or their transplant and there's reasonable plausibility that they could still have replication going on, then that's one thing. But um, I agree, the tests at that point are just not that useful. Thank you so much. And could you all comment a little bit on the use of, of these antivirals in, in the pediatric population? Do we have any good data? Do we have anything to go by or to recommend or to have, recommend against? So if you... Don't mind, I can jump in first. Yeah. So, you know, the 
Paxlovid, Sotrovimab, and Remdesivir are, I won't say studied because, you know, the trials took an age of 18 years, but basically based on some extrapolation of data, the EUA actually gives you till 12 years of age or 40 kilograms. The Molnupiravir, because of some issues and some concerns about bone and cartilage uh, damage, is limited to 18 years. So between 12 and 18, you do have three options. Above 18, I mean, Molnupiravir is only for 18. Unfortunately, I'm not aware of any data with any of the antivirals below 12 years of age. And so, you know, that options tend to be limited. I think remdesivir, there is, and, and the other panelists could, uh, Steve or uh, Catherine could correct me if I'm wrong there, but below 12, there is some uh, conditions where you could use it, but I, I do not think there is any data as far as the outpatient antivirals with the other ones below 12 years of age. I'm very interested because remdesivir is the same class of medications as molnupiravir. They're both RNA-dependent RNA polymerase inhibitors. So I'm, I'm a little interested to see what's happening because we do have reasonable safety data from the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014, 2015 uh, for safety in both pregnant women. And um, uh, I don't, I can't remember how many children were, have been reported on, um, but I, I'm interested to see why that difference exists. And we haven't taken any of these precautions for remdesivir um, in terms of, you know, contraception or any of those things. So uh, interested to see long-term outcomes. And unfortunately we collect this data in real time. So to get, you know, two year, five year outcomes, it's gonna take us, you know, that long. I, I just want to add to that, you know, when we look at the molnupiravir mutagenesis data, the studies that were done in the animal models, they used up to 10 times what the human dosage levels are. And in them, they saw some mutagenesis and some fetal toxicity. The human data does not exist. And I think um, in one of the studies, if I correct, uh, recollect correctly, there was like about a three times level, which did not show too much of mutagenesis. If I Remember correctly, with remdesivir, they did not see too much of that data. And with the, you know, at least the 18 year cutoff on molnupiravir was more because of the bone and cartilage damage rather than the potential for mutagenesis. Thank you so much. And one question from the Q&A. Um, if you have any, any comments on favipiravir, Do you have any comments on favipiravir? No. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's I mean, okay. I know trials have been done, but I, but I think similar to many, um, you know, it's not, these have not proven, uh, you know, in terms of to either shorten the duration, of course. And, and again, when we talk about mortality, as you know, there's, there's actually steroids, uh, you know, I mean, none of these drugs have actually shown that in remdesivir. So I think keeping, keeping, um, keeping the on the ball. I know there's still, you know, the ivermectin and some of these other aspects still come up. And, um, and I think that's the importance. The other thing we've learned about, we would say, um, COVID is the importance of randomized clinical trials, anecdote and observation in clinical acumen are important, but they do not substitute, uh, for, for clinical trials, especially with something I, I think is dynamic is COVID-19. So we still don't want to do any harm, uh, in that regard. You know, I, I think as I think about the future is, um, and as we get to what I would, would call to an endemicity where, where whether coronavirus settles in as a respiratory virus, you know, is part of that, the question will become is, you know, will some of these drugs be able to be used either as prophylaxis for high risk, where, where there might be another strain of people at high risk, um, like we use for in the nursing homes? Will we get to a point where also testing, it won't just be for COVID at home, but it will be for, you know, the four plus with the role that you're going to do some potential intervention. Um, and, you know, to kind of normalize what I would say, um, uh, the time to treat aspects, which are important for other potential respiratory viruses that are treatable in delivering healthcare in a different space. That's threatening. 
uh, to a lot of, or because cheese will be moved. But, um, but I think these are interesting things for us to begin to think about as we move toward hopefully a different respiratory season uh, in 2022. Um, and the other thing I would also add is, you know, we don't have vaccines or antivirals for a lot of these things as well. So um, uh, masking in respiratory season will hopefully be something that will be adopted um, in terms of once you reach a certain threshold of the, what I call, whatever respiratory viruses are circulating in the hospital or in the community, you know, and it's a choice to be able to wear that in the schools, but in our hospitals, um, it, it's another way, um, I think post pandemic, uh, non-pharmacologic intervention to protect ourselves from uh, obviously our healthcare workers, as well as for, for healthcare transmission of not just coronavirus, but influenza, RSV, things that, things that we've all observed. And Steve, I see that you, that you marked one of the questions to answer it live. Uh, regarding monoclonal antibodies. So that's why I'm calling on you first. Um, so when to use monoclonal antibody, three, five days, when? So similar to what was said by the other panelists, uh, you know, this is in that hopefully early phase of viral replication before antibodies are, are, are produced. So the window earlier, the better. So it's the same thing we're talking about the oral antivirals, same thing for the MAPs. You get up to 10 days, um, you know, from the onset of symptoms, but many of us have, you know, we've, you know, you kind of give the patient the, how can I say that? We've, we've all kind of, I think, squibbled on that line 10 days from the test, 10 days from the symptoms, uh, in terms of high risk patients. So again, another time sensitive intervention, um, but my panelists can correct me, but, but 10 days is still uh, the magic number people are sticking to. That's correct. And the only thing I, I do want to add over there is remember sotrovimab is not authorized to be used for patients who are admitted for COVID-19 or hospitalized for COVID-19 reasons. But if the patient is incidentally hospitalized for some other reason, found to be COVID-19 meets the EUA criteria, then sort of a map could be given. Otherwise, it would be via IND. Um, and I would just emphasize that I, I realize I'm talking to a primary pulmonology audience, but um, people with CF patients, chronic, chronic bronchiectasis patients, lung transplant patients, communicate with them. If they are getting symptoms very early, they need to present early. Um, because otherwise, um, as our, my other colleagues have been saying, we're not going to be able to get to them. Timing. That's perfect. And my friend, Holly. Hi, Holly. Thank you for joining us today. Asked if, do you think uh, pine tree protocol is available, is applicable to vaccinated patients, given that these patients were excluded from the trial? We're not able to do it on an outpatient basis yet. So it requires inpatient admission for mildly symptomatic patients um, who are high risk, which adds strain to an already overstretched health system. Wondering if the benefit is really there in vaccinated patients. And for context, Holly um, sees a lot of trans lung transplant patients and, and also chronic lung diseases. So what do you, what do you think? Okay to do early remdesivir for vaccinated I've been doing it for a few cases since it's been approved and it does have Medicare approval now, um, but it, it, it's really gonna be a case by case evaluation and it's a cost benefit. So I don't know how much it costs on the civilian side for us, it's about 350 a vial, $350. Um, so for a three day course, that's approximately $1,500, which cost efficacy um, theoretically should be cheaper than admitting somebody to the ICU with COVID but I don't know what the number needed to treat is yet. And I don't know that anybody's got that. Yeah, I would concur. I think in an immunosuppressed patient, I mean, um, you know, from our point of view, there's only a downside, right? If the patient does okay, that's good. But if the patient doesn't do okay, there, there's a window miss. So whether it's going to be uh, so trivimab, remdesivir, I mean, in terms of, of that. And I think fortunately here anyway, we're beginning, we're on that falling slope of Omicron. So um, things are easing up in terms of uh, most importantly staff, because uh, that was our biggest constraint. It, you know, nursing physicians, everyone kind of out with the Omicron. So, so I think it's, it's, it's a different horizon 
probably in February than it was in January in terms of, um, as she mentioned, the, the constraints. Yeah, one thing I would add to that is it's not just the cost of the drug, it's also the cost of infusion, the nursing care and whatever else that is involved. And that sometimes does become a limiting factor. That being said, last Friday, the FDA approved the outpatient remdesivir indication. And the hope is that at some point of time, you know, there will be a mechanism by which insurances will pick up the tab. And as Catherine mentioned, I mean, even if the cost is $3,000, it's less than one day of hospitalization. And particularly in a, either an immune suppressed patient or a patient with uh, clinical risk factors, even if they are vaccinated, I, I would say probably doing it may be okay, though the data is not very clear on that because the vaccinated patients, as your question, uh, you know, as the audience, whoever put in the questions uh, alluded correctly to was excluded from the pine tree trial. You know, Alice, if I can add one thing, I think, to, um, you know, we were talking about um, uh, what we would say spike exposed and things, but I just want to emphasize that right now, still in 2022, there is not a antibody test that correlates of immunity. Uh, and yes, there are antibody testing, um, you know, that you can get commercially uh, that were all approved on the EUA. And all of us have seen the fancy um, what I would say, antibody testing for the vaccine trials, that is not what you're, that's not what we're getting. So I do think in the future, and that will come, that, that can be very helpful also in risk assessment potentially in terms of, of patients who are spike exposed or things of this nature uh, moving forward. But I still would not encourage anyone to get antibody testing. I know that's a, you know, it's a common question that still comes up. Um, and, and I think it's important for the audience to, to recognize that, although I know a lot of, you know, a lot of people are still concierge wise are, are getting access to testing in terms of this nature. Um, so, so we don't do that at the clinic, uh, in terms of this, um, it's not to say that when a FDA approved test that has a correlate for immunity, yeah, well, we'll be right on board. Absolutely. Can the other clinic either. Sorry, Catherine, go ahead. Oh, absolutely concur. I mean, not all antibodies are created equally and we don't know how much is enough and we don't know whether it's a uh, recency for a vaccination and why that works or if there's a specificity involved. Uh, but we do know for some diseases, for example, HIV, they make all the antibodies in the world and they don't do anything. So just because someone has antibodies doesn't necessarily mean a thing. Um, so uh, more to follow and hopefully we may get some more specific assays, but right now we don't have them. And a few questions came on the role of ivermectin. So um, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if someone wants to venture on that one. Totally okay if you don't, because it's no. not an antiviral. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I'm happy to weigh in on a more, a cycle, uh, you know, it's interesting, the ivermectin story, all of us were, you know, we're desperate to find whenever we see an illness, whatever pandemic to find, to find cures. And again, um, there are some bright people that were involved. I mean, um, including in the ID society, obviously, um, you know, I you can mention names because it's there, obviously in Marseille and, and in terms of this nature, but where this fell apart uh, was the clinical trial work and where it even fell further apart is is in the peer review process. So many of these trials, the, the big one that showed um, outside the lab, the first clinical outcome was done in Egypt and that article was pulled down, uh, but it was pulled down. It didn't make a difference. Where it got more legs, in my opinion, was when it was tied into um, freedom of speech in this country, you know, where people like me might say, you know, the trials aren't there. I, I'm not saying don't, I'm not saying that it wasn't worthwhile to do trials, but you got to call what I say, you know, be honest in terms of this nature. And when people felt that they were being shut down, I think, uh, became a freedom of speech. And then a whole different cohort picked up, not so much on the medical thing, but on censorship, freedom of speech, Fauci shutting people down. And then it got some sea legs. So I think all of us were humility, but, but we want to be data driven. We don't want to do any harm. Um, and so I, I do think the ivermectin story, although it may not be dead from a, from a, from a clinical trials point of view, uh, um, it, there really is no signal there for SARS-CoV-2. And I'll let my other colleagues weigh in. I would just say one thing here. As physicians, the 
prime victim we have is do no harm. And if we are going to start using things based on anecdotal or small data sets, which really have not definitely shown a benefit and have potentially some harm, then you know we are not doing the patient any good. So unless there is randomized clinical trial data that supports using something, even if it may be biologically plausible in some cases, I, I would strongly caution against using something that, that may in the end end up doing our patient more harm than good. And companies like to sell their medications. And so if their internal modeling data is saying that at doses that are safe in humans are not effective in vivo, and they're saying, please don't use our medicine, um, I, I take that pretty pretty strongly because you know people like to sell what they can. And if they if a business is telling you, stop, don't do this, don't, don't buy our product for this indication, um, I imagine they have a good reason behind it. Thank you so much for answering that question. Um, it's a little bit of a curveball, but I knew I knew it was going to come. So I appreciate you all um, giving our audience the grace of answering it. And um, time flies when you're having fun. So we only have seven minutes left. Um, so I want to, again, thank you all for joining us today. And I was hoping that um, as we say goodbye and thank you to our audience, all of you could could tell me like two take home points from oral antivirus for COVID um, to make sure that our audience um, takes with them. Catherine, I see you first on my screen. So how about you start? I would say early and uh, run your contraindications. Steve, go. Um. I'm, I'm going to say I am not all in at this point. I mean, um, in terms of this, I really think that the landscape has changed and, um, and I think we really need to get follow-up studies in terms of, of patients, in terms of the response uh, this way. So I do think, but, but I think what is great though, is that we are moving the armamentarium just all uh, off an all vaccine approach. And this will hopefully continue to lend more discovery in terms of antivirals or, or products that are effective, not just against uh, SARS-CoV-2, but other respiratory viruses that we don't have great treatments for. So um, I'm putting a cautious kind of, um, you know, to be determined, so to speak. And I, I love would, it. I would second what Catherine said as regards early, and I would also add to that the caveat that early in most cases now means outpatient. And so if we are thinking that these are available for inpatients as of this moment, we do not have data to support that use. And then the other point I would make, which you know doesn't apply just to oral antivirals, but comes back to our ivermectin point is, let's do management of patients based on science and hard data and hard data, remember, when we look at what is good data, it's, you know, the, when we have the hierarchy, randomized clinical trials are the best data there. And, and so let's base our management on science and actual data rather than on anecdotal or small case series or case studies or, you know, case reports. And, and that is what I, I think would be a message that I would want everyone to take home from here. I love all of these mess messages, cautious optimism, Timing, very important. They are not available for inpatient, so use them for outpatient and data-driven. I love it. Thank you all so much for coming, and I hope you had as much fun and learned as much as I did. And I would like to thank all our chess audience for logging in today. And stay safe, and thank you so much for all you do. And Catherine, thank you so much for your service. Thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.